Hello and welcome to this module where we will be looking at how to use Java Config in your Spring applications. I'm sure you know me by now, Richard Chesterwood. I'm the trainer of all of the Virtual Pair Programmers previous Spring courses. And of course, I will be assuming that you're already knowledgeable about the Spring framework, but you want to know what Java Config is all about. And it all comes down to XML, which it is fair to say, I think today, hated by many developers. Not all developers for sure, but a simple search of the phrase XML hell gives many results. And even though I didn't mention Spring in the search, Spring is very prominent in these results. And there's a reference here to Java config. And anyway, you're a Spring developer yourself. So I guess you already know for yourself some of the problems with XML in Spring. Before we start coding, a quick history lesson. When Spring was first devised, its aim was to replace the need to use EJBs. Now, this was around the year 2003, 2004. And one of the problems at the time with EJBs was that you needed to write a mass of XML in the form of so-called deployment descriptors. Now, what you're seeing on screen now is a screenshot from my live EJB course that I was forced to do around that time. And it was indeed hellish. The documents were massive. Many of the fields were mandatory even though they were really dull and routine, there were no good defaults. And the schema of these documents were really poorly designed. So you had nested tags where they weren't necessary, and you had the reverse. You had related data that was scattered across the documents rather than being grouped together. Now we often used to resort to using tools to generate this XML, which at the time, many people thought was a good solution. But I find usually that when you're forced to use a tool to generate something, there's usually something fundamentally wrong with the underlying development process. So all of that is ancient history now. I'm sure you don't care about this today, but it is worth understanding why, in Java circles in particular, XML has always had this kind of hatred, and I don't think it's ever going to recover from the bad feeling that first set in back in those days. So when Spring was invented, they decided that XML was still valuable because configuration details should be separated from the code in order to reduce coupling. But the XML that Spring worked with was really simplified. So back in Spring 1, and again, I'm showing you a screenshot here from one of my very early versions of the Spring Framework course. At first, the XML looked really lovely. There were only really three tags to understand. You had beans, bean and property, and everything that you needed to do in Spring could be achieved with just those three tags. Well, I say at first it looked lovely. The trouble was, in order to do anything useful in Spring, such as declaring transactions or doing AOP, well, you needed a lot of these beans, and the XML got far too unwieldy. So in Spring 2, they decided to add extra tags, and I sometimes unofficially call these the macro tags. For example, here in this Spring project, we have the tag annotation driven. You probably know that this tells Spring that we want to use transactions and that it should automatically search for annotated transactional classes. In Spring 1, this would have been a massive pile of XML. We would have to configure transaction proxies, we had to configure lots of properties, and we had to wire it all together. But from Spring 2 onwards, 
it turned into a very concise configuration. But there is a problem with these macro tags, I have to admit, and I think Spring here made a mistake. They were, at the time of Spring 2 and Spring 3, completely obsessed with modularity. I think to the point where they went way over the top. And they decided that instead of making these macro tags just freely available, and we could just use them without thinking about it, they decided that these should be optional additions to our project and that we should have to import these macros into our project. And to do that, they used the standard XML concept of namespaces. And for this reason, you do usually hear these macro tags, as I call them, referred to as the namespaces. So, for example, we would say here on line 19 that we're using the TX namespace. And what they did, unfortunately, is they made all of these namespaces really tiny. So the TX namespace, for example, and I'm using the IntelliSense here to tell me there are only three tags in that entire namespace. We've got Advice, Annotation Driven, and JTA Transaction Manager. So that means that in Spring, there are lots of these namespaces. And on a typical project, you're going to need to import a lot of them. And you probably know by now that the process of doing this is a right pain in the neck because you've got to add this line here to declare the TX namespace. And you also have to include the line that you can see here. This is in fact often split into two separate lines and that's declaring the location of where this namespace is declared. I think on the Spring Fundamentals course, I went into a bit of depth here and I showed you where to find this file here, this springtx.xsd. Actually, that's buried in one of your jar files. So you end up with this block here, which is really ugly and difficult to deal with. And I have seen many of the Spring Framework teams say, well, this isn't a problem because you can use the Spring IDE to automatically add these lines. But, but there we go again with using tools to simplify processes that should have been simple in the first place. So to summarize that then, if you can kind of ignore the misery that's going on up here, then you should find that the XML down here is pretty tolerable. Now you'll probably know that on real projects, Still, these XML documents, even using these namespaces, can get too big, and that's definitely true. You can split them down using imports, which is actually what I've done on this project here, and we did that on the fundamentals course as well. And you can also use annotations for some or all of your classes. Personally, in real life, I always use annotations for my Spring MVC controllers because frankly, I don't find controllers interesting. They shouldn't contain any interesting logic. They are important cogs in the architecture, but I don't want to be wiring them up all the time because I never, or at least rarely, want to rewire them or change them around in any kind of intelligent way. So that was a quick review of the wiring options that you had available until Spring 3. But Spring 3, introduce the concept of Java configuration. And I'm going to call it from this point onwards, Java config. Now it didn't immediately become popular, but it has over the last two or three years really suddenly become very popular. And it does now seem to be the preferred configuration choice for probably most projects. The reference manuals for Spring have started to use it heavily. And I think most significantly, the book Spring in Action, which for many years was my favorite book on Spring. In the latest edition, they now use Java config almost exclusively. And the author constantly makes references to XML in a very disparaging way. I'm here on their free sample of chapter 12, which is the working with NoSQL databases chapter. 
And there's a very good example. This paragraph here where he's saying, well, for what it's worth, you can do this in XML, but oh, well, really, you don't want to do that. If you, if you have a fondness for XML, and I infer from that he thinks that anyone who does is probably mad, then he does reluctantly give an XML sample. Now, I'm not criticizing Craig Walls' book here. I still think it's the best book on the Spring Framework. I'm really trying to illustrate that the current climate in the Spring Framework community is very much against XML configuration. Also, there is a project called Spring Boots, which is a way of getting your Spring projects up and running really quickly. We will be producing a module on this at some point in the future. It is on my massive to-do list, but this project uses Java config, and you'll see here that they're boasting that there is absolutely no requirement for XML. And since many projects these days are initiating their project using this boot, we are seeing more and more Java config out there in the real world. Now, I'm going to be honest at this stage, and I will admit that I am not personally a fan of Java config. And that's probably why I've really delayed covering this course until now. I personally don't think it's any clearer to work with than XML. In fact, I think it's a very ugly solution to the problem. A better solution would have been to maybe just use a better format than XML, such as YAML. Or even better, they could have used a dynamic language like Scala or Groovy to allow us to configure the Spring container using program code that has been made to look like simple configuration. In other words, a DSL, a domain specific language. I think one of the reasons that I've always enjoyed working with Spring is Spring traditionally enforced a separation between the deployment aspects of your architecture, in other words, how your system is wired up, and the actual code. And when you start to do the configuration in Java, I think you lose some of that separation. The separation is still there, to be fair. And you're going to see on this module that there are ways that we can achieve, if you like, dynamic wiring using Java config. So it's not all bad. And certainly many of you are using it on projects. It's my job to help you to understand these frameworks. So I'm going to put my grumpiness to one side. I'll pretend I like Java config, and I'm going to give you what I hope will be a really good guide through it. We're going to start with a basic project just to establish the fundamentals of Java config. And then we're going to take one of the projects that we've built on one of the earlier courses and I'll show you how to convert it into a full Java config project. Along the way, we'll be configuring the business tiers. So we'll be doing things like connection pools, and then we'll do the web tier with Java config, the Spring MVC. And finally, and this has been very heavily requested, we will look at how to do Spring security and Spring OAuth using Java config. So we're now going to start with a very basic overview of how Java config works. And to do that, I have pre-prepared for you what is probably the most simple Spring project possible. And it's currently configured using XML. And of course, the job is going to be for us to convert that into a Java config version. If you want to follow along with me, then you will find a folder in your starting workspace folder called basic Spring projects. As usual on virtual pair programs courses, I have switched the workspace to be that starting workspace folder. And I'm going to open the project by going File, New, Java Projects, and then for project name, exactly the same name as the folder name, which is basic Spring Projects. And we should see the message you can see here. Let me take you through what we have here. Very similar to the kinds of code we would have had in the very early stages of the Spring Framework Fundamentals course. We have two classes here inside the package called Beans. I couldn't think of very interesting names for these classes. So I've just gone for class A and class B. The idea is that class A contains a reference 
to class B. Now I've called that reference dependency. I have a pair of get and set methods so that we can configure it using dependency injection. I have here a business method and that business method is going to delegate to that dependent class to get a value out of it, which it will just print to the console. We also have a method here called create bean eight. I'll show you what that's for a little bit later on in this demonstration. For class B, similarly simple. This one has a string value, which we can get and set. And again, this destroyed bean B will be useful a little later on. Of course, the interesting aspects of this is that we're wiring these beans together using standard Spring XML. We have here the definition of bean A and its property, which is the dependency, which is referring to bean B, which Spring will instantiate and will set the value to some string. We don't really care what that is. And to tie it all together, we have a main test harness here, which is going to open the standard class path XML application context, which you know is the implementation of the Spring container or the Spring factory, which reads an XML file from the class path. And then I'm going to get one of the beans from class A, and then I'm going to call the business method. All very simple, all very dull. Let's check that it runs. And it does. Don't worry about the red text. That's because we have not configured a logging system yet for this project. So we need to get this converter to use Java config instead. But before we start, a word of warning. If you go to a search engine and search for Java config, you're very likely to find the top result is the one that you can see here, which looks just about perfect. The Spring Java config reference guide and you might be very tempted to start studying what you find in here. But if you check out the dates that you can see here, of course, this is a very old document. And what we're in fact seeing here is the manual for the very final version of Spring Java Config when it was a side project to Spring. It was until 2008, an experimental project that you could download as an optional extra. But from November 2008, it became absorbed into the core spring. So it no longer has its own reference manual. And that's why web searches for Java config can be very confusing. So make sure that whatever you're looking at, it's always up to date and part of the standard Spring reference. I've now switched to the standard page for the core Spring framework, and I'm going to find the reference manual for, I'll go for the 4.2.2, .2, which is currently the live version. And it's not that easy to find, but if you go down to section six, this is the details on how to configure what they used to call the inversion of control container. The first few sections in this section are dealing with the XML version, but eventually you will find a section called Java based container configuration. At the time of recording, it was section 6.12, and this really is the reference manual for Java config. So do check out that manual for full details, but I'm going to be showing you over the next few moments the main aspects of Java configuration. The main idea behind Spring Java configuration is that instead of writing an XML file, we're going to express exactly the same configuration, the fact that we have two objects called bean A and bean B and that they're connected together using Java code instead. And I suppose there are two promised advantages of doing that. As a Java programmer, you might just find it more readable and more understandable to look at Java code instead of XML. And the second reason is that because it's going to be Java code, typing mistakes are going to be picked up by the compiler. Let's say, for example, I change bean B to just be bean. That's not going to cause any problems because I don't have any special plugin installed. This is just an XML file. So the built-in Eclipse compiler 
isn't going to see anything bad about that. But of course, we now have an unsatisfied dependency here. There is no bean called bean B. So we will see at runtime an exception. So where to start then? Well, all we need to do is to define a new class. And this class can be called anything you like. I'm going to go for application configuration, and it can be in any package you like. I think I'm going to create a new package called com.virtualpairprogrammers.config. And the idea is that what we do inside this class is we first of all annotate it with the standard spring annotation of at configuration, which will of course need to be imported. And you can see that it comes right from the standard spring framework. And inside this configuration class, we're really just going to do exactly what we were doing in the XML. And on the occasions where I've had to convert an application from XML to Java config, what I generally do is cut the XML and I'm going to delete the application.xml file altogether. And then in our new file, I'm going to paste this in and make it be a comment. And that gives me a really handy reference because, and I've said this a couple of times, what we're doing in this configuration class is going to be identical to what we were doing in the XML. To tell the spring that we want it to instantiate a bean and we want it to have the name of bean A and we want it to be of this particular class, we simply write a Java method. And the method is going to return an instance of the class that we want Spring to instantiate. So in this case, it's going to be class A. As with all methods, the method needs to have a name. We can technically call this method anything we want. But what will happen is whatever object that we return from this method, Spring is going to catch that object it will put it into the Spring container and it will give it the ID of whatever we called this method. So if we want to copy exactly what we had before, then this method needs to be called bean A. And for the method implementation, we're going to do what the Spring container used to do. And that is we are going to do the work of instantiating an instance of the class A class. So I could do a return new class A. Now none of this is compiling because I will need to import class A. So that's compiling. I clearly haven't done all of the work that was in the XML. I think just to get things started, I'm going to go ahead now and do exactly the same work for our bean B. So it's going to be very routine, really just changing the A's for the B's. And in here, we will return a new instance of class B, which itself will need to be imported. So that Spring knows that we are intending these methods to be bean definitions, we have another annotation that we need to add on each of these methods, and that is the at bean, which of course will need to be imported. It comes from the same package as the configuration annotation. So we'll need to do that for both of these new methods. We're about halfway there now. Spring will be able to parse this class and it will understand that we want to instantiate an instance of each of these classes. But we haven't done any of the dependencies or the values. So how do we do that? Well, I'm going to start with bean B. We need to pass into bean B somehow this value of some amazing value. Well, really, there's no complexity behind this other than that we manually call the setter method. So I'll do a refactor here. Instead of instantiating and returning in one go, I'm going to create an instance, which I'm going to call bean B. And then I can call the setter method, the set value method. And let's make it something slightly different. This is going to be a second amazing value and we'll return that bean B back. So I hope you're getting a flavor for how this Java config works. 
we're really doing the work that the container used to do. Now for the first slightly complex piece of work. Our bean A here needs to have a reference to bean B. So how do we do that? Well, I'll do a similar job to before, first of all, and create a variable for the bean. And there are two ways that we can do this. The general answer is we're going to call the setter method of bean A, and the setter is called set dependency. And we need somehow to get this instance of bean B. The first way of doing it, I think, is the, I suppose, the obvious way. We can just call this method. So we could say in here, bean B. And I'm really trying to elaborate things here a little bit, but I realize that I hope this all should feel fairly natural to you because it is just standard regular Java. There is a second way of doing this dependency. I'll show you that in a few moments when we have this working. But I think we've now reached the point in our configuration where we have reflected exactly what we had in the XML previously with Java configuration instead. So that's OK, only if it works. So we'll need to go to our main class now. And we're going to need to make a change here because, of course, currently we're reading the XML file. Somehow we need to read this application configuration class instead. Now, I think I will have covered this on the Java Fundamentals course, but if you're not using XML, then there is an alternative version of the application context, and it's called the annotation config application context. So I'll need to change that on both sides of the assignments. Of course, that's not right. We need to replace this file name, and instead, we pass in a reference to the configuration class, which is application configuration dot class. And I hope that wasn't too difficult, but we should now have a working version of a Java config project. And there you are, it's working exactly as before. I did say there's a second way of supplying dependencies, and I must admit, I don't know why, but I think this is my preferred way of passing a dependency from one bean to another. We can instead declare as a parameter into this class an instance of class B. And I can call this anything I like. I'm just going to go for dependency. And the Spring container just knows that if we've declared a parameter in one of these at bean methods, then we must be referring to another bean that we've created elsewhere in the configuration. It doesn't matter if that bean's declared after or before. That's absolutely fine. It will know to automatically search for wherever we've declared this instance of class B. So that's slightly different. It means we don't have to call a method in here. Instead, now we can just refer to this dependency object. And I could have supplied a common separated list of arbitrarily many dependencies, assuming that I had that many bean definitions elsewhere. So let's check that that's working, and it is. So it's entirely up to you which of those versions you use. It's really dependent on your own taste. And you're going to find that as we go further with Java config, that there are often several ways of achieving the same goal. Now, I do want to point out that if you compare the Java with the XML, you'll see that it isn't really any shorter. In fact, we've ended up with more lines of code than we had in the original XML. So you are going to find that it's usually impractical to keep your entire configuration in a single Java file. So you're going to want to break these files up on a real project. We're going to be doing a real project shortly where we will definitely want to do that. Of course, for this project, it's not really necessary, but I'd like to show you how we could separate these two bean definitions into two separate configuration files. And the first part of it is quite simple, really. We can just declare multiple configuration classes. So I might call this one second configuration. And as previously, we will need the configuration annotation on the top. And I think for this project, I'm going to take the second bean and I'm going to move it 
across into this second configuration class. To keep things consistent for the practicals and code folder, I'm also going to take the comment where I've got the corresponding XML. I think I'm going to preserve that because it's probably quite useful. OK, well, this is still compiling and it's compiling because in the Java, there are no dependencies between these two classes. I should mention that if I'd gone for the previous version of declaring these dependencies, you'll remember previously I had a call to the bean b method. Well, that version wouldn't work here because, of course, we don't have visibility of the bean b method in this class. So that's one good use of this parameter based technique. It means it's easier to separate the configuration classes. But the problem is in our main class at the minute, we're only pointing to one of those configurations. So I think if we give this a run, yeah, we have an exception. And the exception is it can't create bean A because it has an unsatisfied dependency. It can't find any declaration of bean B. There are two ways we can fix this. The first way, and probably the simplest way, is we could have here in our main method, we could provide a comma separated list of all of the configuration classes in our system. So we could have added second configuration dot class and now these two configurations are going to be combined together let's check if that's working and it is back to working now so that is quite tedious to do but it's actually very useful when you're doing things like testing systems and you're wanting to assemble a collection of different configurations and we will be doing that later on in this course when we build an integration test. But in general, if this is your production run, it's pretty tedious having to list all of the configurations here. So the alternative, and really, once again, this is identical to what you could do in the XML. You'll recall that in your XML config, you are able to use the import tag. Well, we have a direct analogy here on the configurations. There is an apt import annotation again from exactly the same package and in here i can specify the name of another configuration class that i want to combine with this one so this would be the second configuration dot class now we're back to working again so the import annotation is identical to the xml version of import which i'm sure you're very familiar with already you're probably familiar with the concept in the XML of the init and destroy methods. The idea of the init and destroy methods is that we can specify in the XML that when the container creates an instance of a bean, we also want it to automatically run a particular method. And the destroy methods is the same in reverse, really. When we close the spring container, we might sometimes want Spring to make sure that it calls a special destroy method before the container is closed. We had a use for both of those requirements on our Spring Fundamentals project. When we start up our database connections, we want to run an initialize method that will make sure that the tables have been created. But more importantly, for the destroy method, we'll always want to make sure that when we're closing our system, any database connections have been successfully closed. Well, we'll be talking about all of that when we get to our real project a little bit later on in this module. But I'd like to show you the theory behind that. And it's actually quite simple. Now, you might have noticed when I was introducing the project that here in class A, I've put in there a method called created bean A. It's not currently being called, but let's say I would like that method to be automatically called when this bean is created. How can I do that? Well, the answer is we simply have to supply a parameter into the at bean annotation. I'll use the IntelliSense here to show that there is a parameter here called init method. And it's a little bit odd because it's just a string. So we've got to be careful with this. And of course, it's going to be just the name of the method that we want to be called. And similarly, 
in class B, I have a method that I would like to be called when the container is being closed down. So that's going to be through an attribute here on the at bean annotation, this time for class B. So I'm in the other configuration file. And this one is the destroy method. And that's going to be, in this case, destroyed bean B. So if I run the code this time, you can see the point in the application's lifetime where this is where bean A was created. And this is the, the end of the run where bean B was destroyed. If you're running this on your own project, then you will only see the destroying if in your main method you have explicitly called the close method on the container. Now I'm in the reference manual here at 6.12.3 where they're talking about how to use this bean annotation and they're confirming there that we can use init method and destroy method. Just going a little further down though, there's something that I would like you to remember for a little later on in the course when we are setting up a full project. It's telling us that by default, beans using Java config that have either a public close or shutdown method will be automatically enlisted with a destruction callback. So that's going to mean that if we have an object in the Spring container with close or shutdown, then we don't have to explicitly register that destroy method. I have to say, I hate this because it's very magic and you have to kind of know that that's going to happen. And we're going to find as we go a little further through this course that there's quite a lot of this where they're doing things for you to try to help you. But it's not much help, really, because you have to know that it's doing this anyway. So I'd like you to bear this in mind for a little later on when it will become relevant to us. Don't worry if you forget it, though, because, of course, I will be highlighting this when we get there. But for this basic overview of Java config, there's really just one last thing I want to cover. And I'm going to cover it here because we won't be using this again when we go ahead and build a more complicated project. And that's related to the scope of the beans that we're creating. Now, you probably know or you should know that when you're working with XML, the default is that Spring always creates singletons really just means that each of the beans is instantiated once and once only. And we need to know if that's true in Java config as well. And I'm not going to tease this out really, because I hope you're getting the flavor by now that everything that we're doing in Java config is just a replacement for the XML. It's not in any way changing the underlying model about how Spring works. So therefore, exactly as in the XML. What we're seeing with these configurations is that we're always going to be getting, by default, singleton beans, which you should know from Java Fundamentals, means that, again, by default, Spring is only going to instantiate one of these beans, no matter what we do. So if I go back into the main, we've already got one reference here to class A. But if I were to declare another instance of class A, and I'm going to call this, let's call it second bean. If I do a container.getBean, I'll type class A, and I can call it business method again, exactly as in standard spring XML configuration the container will not create a second instance of this bean. Instead, it's going to hand as a reference to the same bean that was created here on line 15. And we can verify that by running the code. And our init method, I hope you can see, is only being run once. If you're in any way confused about this terminology of singletons, then do check out the Spring Framework Fundamentals course, but it means exactly what I've said. There's only going to be one instance of that being created, no matter how many times we try to access that bean. But as with standard Spring, we can switch that configuration and we can tell it that each time we try to access an instance of class A, 
we want a brand new fresh instance to be created. You don't do that very often in Spring because the kind of use cases that Spring is designed for is for configuring things like service classes, DAOs, and connection pools, and those kinds of things. And very, very often, you want those to be singletons because they don't contain any state and it's just more efficient to keep reusing a single instance. So it's not very often that you do it, but Spring calls a bean that you want to be created each time a prototype bean. And it's very easy to specify that we want it to be a prototype. We use the at scope annotation here in the Java config. It will take a single parameter and that's going to be prototype. When you're importing this, make sure you choose the Spring Framework version of Scope. And you can probably guess that when we go into the web tier, we can also use Session as a scope in here as well. So the difference this time will be that now you can see that the init method is being called twice because we're now having two instances of that being created. Even though this bean here is configured as a prototype scope, the dependency bean, the class B, is still going to be the default scope of Singleton. So these two beans that we've created are sharing a reference to the same objects. Now, although this second configuration was useful to show you how you can split your configuration into multiple files, for this final demonstration, it's going to be clearer if I merge the configurations back together again. So I'm going to take the code out of here. And for the practicals and code folder, the final solution for this chapter will not have the second configuration file, but I'm sure that's no great loss really. So I think I will even delete second configuration from the project and I don't need this import anymore. And the reason I've done that is I want to use the alternative version of passing in this dependency. You'll remember from not very long ago that there's two ways of passing this dependency. We can either make it a parameter into here, or we can just go ahead and call the bean b method just like that. The reason that I'm doing that is I want to illustrate that if we take a step back a moment and remind ourselves what's going to happen here, because bean A we've declared to be a prototype, when we run our main method, you might think that that means it's going to call this method twice. And therefore, if you check out the call to bean B there, you might expect this bean B method to be called twice as well. But remember that bean B is the default scope. This is going to be a singleton. So actually, we only want this method to be called once. But I want to make a really important point here that when we run our application, Spring isn't simply executing this Java as if it were standard Java. Spring is if you like, parsing this Java to understand what the structure of our beans should be. Again, as I've said many times in this chapter, the Java that we're seeing here is just an alternative representation of the XML that we had before. And even though this looks like a method call here, I would advise that you don't think of it as being a method call. It's more of a kind of a static declaration, exactly as you would have done in the XML. If you really want to know what's going on here, you can check out the reference manual and you might even want to hunt through the Spring Framework source code. In fact, it's using a clever system of proxies. So what it means in practice is that at runtime, when it comes to create this second bean, it will know that it does not have to execute this method here because this bean is a singleton and it has already been created. Now, don't take my word for it. We can prove this very easily by adding in a print line here called the creation of bean b. We expect to see that code run 
once and once only. However, the code here we expect to be run twice. Even though that doesn't look right according to the Java, Spring is doing some clever tricks with Java here. I seem to have an error in my main class, and I think it's just an abandoned import. So Control or Command Shift O to clean those up. Everything's clean. Let's give this a run. And we can now verify that we are indeed seeing two calls to the creation of bean A, but only one to the creation of bean B. And you might be surprised to see the ordering of these bean creations. But again, we can appeal to our standard spring knowledge. If we have a singleton, then it's going to be created eagerly on startup. So that's why bean B is being created immediately. But a prototype bean only gets created when it is needed. So that means that bean A is being created after bean B. It's a relatively minor point, really. The important point is that scopes are respected in exactly the same way as in the XML. So in this chapter, we've had a run through really most of the features of Java configuration. The trick is to be able to apply this to a production environment. So in the next chapter, we'll be switching to one of the projects from a previous spring training course, and we're going to convert the whole of a much more complicated XML file into Java config. So there's still a long way to go. I'll see you for the next part.